Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? We're waking up after a long weekend, right? Um, so my name is Ilya Grigoric. I work on the Make the World Fast team at Google. I'm also a developer advocate for uh, Google Chrome. So I focus on all things performance at Google, which is to say uh, we work on, of course, making uh, Google products faster. Uh, but we also uh, try to live up uh, to the goal of making the web faster as a whole, which is to say we work a lot and contribute a lot to a variety of different projects, like improving the TCP uh, stack, contributing to the Linux kernel, um, building Chrome, and everything in between. So today what I figured uh, what we're going to do is we have a lot of time, right? Or relatively a lot of time. Uh, three hours. And unlike maybe a regular session where we're usually have to be constrained to a specific narrow topic of performance, whether that's CPU or GPU or network, we can actually take kind of a broader view as to how does this stuff actually work, right? Because I think it's very important to understand the why before we, we talk about the how. Because sometimes you, you, know, you read the latest blog post with like, here's the coolest thing that you can do to make your TCP go faster. And then you hurt yourself in the process because you're optimizing the wrong thing. Or it wasn't the problem to begin with. So with that, um, I spent a lot of time over the weekend trying to think as to how to structure this uh, such that it actually makes sense. And I'm glad to say that I've actually managed to boil it down to all into one slide. So everything you need to know about performance is just right here. So if you understand how this entire uh, diagram works, then uh, we're good. We're done. And uh, with that, we can take some questions and you know, plenty of time. All right. Not really. So we're going to split this into three parts. We're going to talk about the network, because that's uh, basically that's the foundation of our performance strategy. We need to, of course, deliver the actual web app uh, to your mobile device or to a desktop device. Then we're going to talk about this concept of critical rendering path, uh, which I think is a, kind of a foreign concept to a lot of people, but incredibly important and something that we focus quite a bit at Google. And then uh, last but not least is uh, in-app performance. So once the page is loaded or once the application is loaded, uh, you know, it may be there for a while. Think of Gmail, right? It sits there in the tab for sometimes days, and uh, there's just different constraints there that we need to optimize for, like JavaScript performance, uh, garbage collection, uh, rendering, and, and the rest. So with that, let's get right in. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, it, it's important to motivate this use case, right? Like, performance matters. Performance is fun. I love to optimize uh, my code such that it runs faster, but uh, what's the point, right? Is, this, is it the kind of thing that you just do for fun uh, because it makes you feel good, or does it actually affect the bottom line? And I have a couple of case studies that I'll just uh, share with you guys. Uh, first one is, it was, this was actually a joint study done between, between uh, Bing and Google. So this was a study that ran... Um, I think maybe three or four years back uh, now, and it was shared at Velocity Conference. And what happened was both Bing and Google deliberately slowed down uh, their search pages, right? So we, we created a test group uh, of users, and we, we delayed the actual results by, uh, as you can see here, 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds in a second. And then we basically just tracked, like, what happened, right? Uh, do the users click more? Do they click less? Uh, what, what, what about the revenue per user? And what you can see here is that after... Uh, when we added two seconds of delay on the Bing search pages, the revenue per user dropped by 4.3%, which is, of course, a huge number if you think about it, right? Uh, when uh, revenue per user drops by even 0.1%, uh, there's alarm bells going off uh, everywhere uh, at, at an organization like Bing or Google. So 4.3% is absolutely massive. Uh, another case study that was done, this was actually uh, Aberdeen Group, also a few years back. Uh, they looked at a number of e-commerce sites on the web, large e-commerce sites, and they discovered that uh, adding one second of delay uh, would drop the conversion rate on your uh, carts by 7%. Uh, people viewed fewer pages, and of course, the customer satisfaction also went down. So this is not just dollars and cents. This is literally millions of dollars for uh, many applications, right? So every millisecond counts. Um, another data point, a more recent one, so uh, this is uh, a great case study uh, done by one of the Realm analytics vendors. So uh, we'll talk about what Realm means. Uh, it stands for a real user measurement, where they're gathering beacons, performance beacons, from hundreds of different sites of their customers. And what they're showing here is that uh, basically the bounce rate, or the visitors are, are, are clicking back um, more frequently as the page load time increases. So, you know, as you would expect, but this is uh, good data uh, proving it. Uh, 
And last but not least, of course, uh, at Google, we, we pay attention to speed as well. So uh, site speed is, of course, uh, a signal. Uh, it is a good signal for a well-performing uh, well site. So uh, also important to keep in mind. So at the end of the day, basically what I'm saying here is speed is a feature. It's a feature just like any other feature in your application, right? And it should be treated as such. It, speed is not something that you add at the end of your uh, great product sprints. Like, great, you know, we, we built a product, and now on the last day we're going to fix performance. It's like, no, that's, that's not how you do it. Speed is a feature, and it's a critical feature, and it should be prioritized just as you do any other feature on your backlog. So with that, you know, how are we doing today? Right? We want site to be fast. Uh, where are we? First, some constants. Uh, so there's been a number of great uh, user case studies and research done that basically shows that despite the fact that you know, our, our world seems to be getting faster and faster and faster, uh, nonetheless, there are some pretty good constants that have remained over the last you know, decades and will remain constant. And basically what it says is, as long as you react or you respond to the user within a couple of hundred milliseconds, let's say within 300 milliseconds, it feels uh, instant, right? So you click on the button, it immediately gives you feedback. That's, the, that, that's what you want. Uh, once you approach the one second barrier, uh, it, the user basically uh, loses track of the task, or uh, there's a context switch that may happen, right? So you're, you're very busy, you're focused on something, you're trying to send an email, you click the send button, and it's just kind of sitting there, and you're like, oh yeah, I also got to email Bob, and I got to do this other thing, and you lost the user, right, before you know it. So really what you want to do is you, you want to keep the user engaged, and you want to uh, have that fluid experience. You really need to deliver the whole experience in less than one second. Uh, ideally, uh, in fact, you want to keep it within 300 milliseconds, which is kind of, the, the, this is the reason why a lot of the big organizations like Google, Amazon, Bing, and others have this unofficial rule of 250 milliseconds. We want to render all pages in 250 milliseconds, or less, of course, uh, because we want the whole experience to be instant, right? As you type your search query, we want the feedback to be uh, right there. Uh, so that's, that's good. Um, another constant and an interesting one is that our pages are getting ever more complex and more ambitious, right? So this is some data from the HTTP Archive uh, project. Uh, hcparchive.org. And what it tracks is, uh, currently tracks over 300,000 of the most popular sites on the web, and uh, twice every month we basically just crawl the sites and uh, find out how are they built. So we're not really concerned about what's on the pages as much as like how many images do you have, how many JavaScript files are you using web fonts and other things. And uh, what this data shows here is that from, in, from uh, January 2011 till about today, we've nearly doubled the size of our pages. So an average page on the web today, a desktop page is about 1.2 megabytes in size, which is of course very large, and it's composed of over 80 resources. And this is very important, we'll come back to why. Uh, so there's a lot of small resources here. Uh, the good news is the mobile is a little bit better, right? So we are optimizing for mobile, or so it seems. Uh, the pages are lighter, uh, which is good. Uh, but nonetheless, 57 resources, right? Uh, that's a lot of... Uh, it's not just a page, it's an application at this point. So finally, uh, we do, once every year, we run uh, some analysis at Google uh, using Google Analytics. We gather a lot of uh, performance data uh, from all the sites that have it installed and enabled. And uh, last year we did a, a study and we discovered that an average page on a mobile took over five seconds to load. Uh, which, of course, is very long. Think back to our one-second barrier, and we're saying five seconds, right? Uh, the good news is this year we ran, uh, this is data from about uh, a month back, we ran the same analysis, and we discovered that desktop basically did not change. So the, the median page load time for desktop has effectively remained the same, which I guess is not surprising. But for mobile, we actually made a, a pretty nice improvement, so the pages are loading 30% faster. And of course, we don't have the exact reason for why that is true, because it could be, you know, it could be anything. Uh, but our, our theory is that while you know, 4G is rolling out uh, across North America very aggressively, and more users are migrating towards uh, 4G networks or getting upgraded to even even faster 3G networks, and that's great, right? So mobile got 30% faster in the last year, which is awesome. At this point, you know, we can just uh, stop this entire show and say, that's, that's great, right? Uh, I'll just sit back, and next year my site will be 30% faster. Everything will be cool. Uh, we're done. Uh, well, not quite, right? Because our pages are getting bigger as well. So we're, we're putting, as, the more resources we give you guys, the more you use it up. So that's kind of, that cancels out, that engages it. And uh, not only that, but there are some fundamental limitations there as well. 
first of all, let's talk about bandwidth, right? It's certainly true that our network speeds are actually increasing uh, and, and growing uh, across, across the world. So this is data from Akamai. Uh, they have this great free report that you can uh, check out. You can type in any country. And what you see here is that over the last uh, five years uh, on this horizon, uh, Average bandwidth has been increasing quite constantly, right? In fact, Japan is kind of way ahead of the pack for, uh, of everybody else. Uh, but nonetheless, if you look at most of the countries, we're above 5 megabits per second. And the 5 megabits number is actually very important, and we'll come back to why. So that's bandwidth. Uh, latency is much harder, right? So latency is the time that it takes for a packet of data to travel from your computer to the destination, to the server and, and back, right? That's the round trip. So this data is very hard to come by, and uh, FCC actually has started running this yearly uh, study, which is really great. It, this is this is data specifically for the United States, but what they're looking at here is they basically installed um, a measuring node in your home network, right? So they actually send you a device, you install it on your home network, and then they have a measuring node at the ISP. So what they're measuring is the last mile latency. This is not the total end-to-end -end latency between uh, your computer, let's say, at your house and uh, the actual server and the internet, but just you know getting from your house to your ISP. And what they discovered was that for something like fiber to the home, it's 18 milliseconds. For cable, it's 26, and for DSL, it's 43. So just to put this into perspective, 43 milliseconds is about the time it takes uh, for a packet to travel from the west coast to the east coast. Right. So we're talking about the same amount of time just to get from your computer to your local ISP, which is hopefully somewhere not very far, right? I guess which is why which is why we're calling it last mile. So there's some uh, there's definitely some bottlenecks here. And at Google, uh, we we of course track uh, the average round trip time to our servers quite closely, and we know that in the U.S. the average round trip time to Google, so this is end to end, is about 50 to 60 milliseconds, and worldwide it's about 100 milliseconds. So why is this all important? Uh, well, about two years back, or three years back at this point, we ran this uh, st study at Google, very simple study, but I think it illustrates the point well. Uh, what's going to happen if we vary latency and bandwidth? Or you know, let's take those independently and just vary bandwidth and keep latency constant and then uh, do the opposite. So we, what you see here at the top is we start with one megabit per second, so we're just varying bandwidth, right? We picked a sample of pages, and uh, we've, we've allocated one megabit of bandwidth. And the average page load time is about three seconds, OK? We go to about two megabits per second, and the average page load time, um, well, it basically halves, right? It, it's cut in half, which is great. It means we were bandwidth constrained. We couldn't download all the resources. But then something funny happens. Uh, as we continue to increase our bandwidth, we're starting to getting diminishing returns on our page load times. And in fact, once you cross that five megabit threshold, right, we start seeing single-digit uh, performance improvements in terms of the actual page load time. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that you, you saw the numbers previously, right? Uh, most of the households, an average household today is already over five megabits per second, which is to say, I'm guessing most of you guys also have five megabits at, uh, per second at home. You know, you want to make your internet faster, so you, you go out and say, you know what, I'm going to get the new super plan with 15 megabits per second, because that's going to make everything go three times faster. You upgrade, and you get, like, a 3% improvement. You can't even perceive it, and it's like, what happened, right? This thing sucks. Uh, this, the service is terrible. Uh, well, actually, uh, the service could be terrible, of course, uh, but independent of that, uh, bandwidth is actually not the constraint for web pages, and we'll see why in a second. Latency, on the, on the other hand, uh, shows you a very different picture. It basically shows you that as we decrease the latency, we get this nice linear progression of pages getting faster, uh, which is exactly what we wanted, of course. And by the way, this uh, this case study is actually, or the study, uh, is exactly what kicked off our work on Speedy at Google, which of course now is being standardized uh, and extended as HTTP 2.0. So the basic uh, observation here is that bandwidth, of course, matters. And I'm not saying bandwidth doesn't matter. Uh, but after a certain point for web pages, uh, it doesn't give you as much improvement as we would like. Right. So upgrading your 5 megabit connection is not going to give you uh, much improvement, at least for browsing pages.
So bandwidth doesn't matter much, right? And uh, th this is, of course, you know, there's caveats here. If you're, if you're talking about downloading YouTube videos or watching Netflix, of course bandwidth matters. But for pages specifically, uh, it, that's not our constraint. And further, uh, improving bandwidth is, you know, I, I put it in quotes, but it's, it's relatively easy. Like, how do we improve bandwidth? Right? Well, I can get a second line, right? I can just put <coughs> another fiber cable beside it and double my throughput uh, for bandwidth. I mean, it's very expensive, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is doable. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, latency, on the, other, on the other hand, is actually very hard because we have this annoying thing called the speed of light. And we have not yet figured out how to go faster. I guess a few years back, you know, a few researchers in the, uh, thought they had it uh, figured out, uh, but turned out it was a faulty cable. So... There you have it. Um, so the, literally, the only thing we can do to improve uh, latency is lay shorter cables, right? And this is kind of a fun example that, that I like to share. Uh, in the last decade, we haven't actually uh, put any more new fiber between uh, Europe and North America. Uh, because we had enough capacity, right? We just kept upgrading the existing capacity. We made the signaling better and basically just improved throughput that way. Uh, except uh, just recently, there was a new project, uh, and I think it's, it's finished by uh, now, called Hibernia Express. So what these guys have figured out was that, hey, New York and London are two very important financial points around the world, and people would pay money to have lower latency for their trading algorithms. So what we're going to do is we're going to literally just lay a shorter cable than all the other cables, right? In fact, it's going to be 300 miles shorter. <laughs> and that is going to give us five millisecond advantage over everybody else. And uh, this whole project costs about, or in the projected cost, for about $400 million, which is to say, you know, $80 million per unit of millisecond latency, right? Well, that's, not a, that's not a valid unit, but it kind of gives you a feel for, like, you know, every millisecond counts. So in this situation, this is, uh, this is not a public link. This is only for financial uh, applications, but that's one way we can improve latency. And then we come back to mobile, right? So, of course, uh, mobile is top of mind for everybody. It's exploding. And the problem with mobile, or the challenge with mobile, I should say, for web performance is that latencies are so much higher. And uh, we'll actually talk about why that is. Uh, for example, if you look at Sprint and AT&T, I just pulled out these numbers from their technical FAQs. If you dig deep enough, you'll find them there. Uh, they basically say that, hey, for about you know, for a 3G network, expect... 150 millisecond to 400 millisecond round trip through our network, right? That's, that's just the nature of the beast. And for 4G, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 200 milliseconds. So, you know, we're getting a, maybe a 2x improvement. Actually, on, on the newer networks, uh, you can get sub 100 millisecond latency, uh, which is great. Uh, but nonetheless, effectively, just think of mobile as, you know, three to four times the latency of your desktop uh, connection. So why is it that mobile takes so much more uh, time, right? Or why are the latency so much higher? Well, uh, the first thing that you need to know about mobile specifically is that you know, the network is designed to meet certain design criteria, design constraints, right? So in your house, you have a wireless router. And the wireless router follows a very simple strategy. It just says, uh, there's one access point. There's a bunch of people that want to talk to me. So if you want to talk to me, just talk to me, right? There's no coordination involved whatsoever. Right? And this works great. You can actually prove it, mathematically prove it, that uh, this will deliver pretty good performance uh, as long as the network is not loaded, as, lo as long as there's not many devices in the room. Then you get into a room like this one, and you have one, wi one Wi-Fi access point, and everybody, everybody here tries to send data or receive data, and all of a sudden the network collapses. Right? And Wi-Fi has no, uh, no way to control for this. Right? It, uh, once the network is, is in this uh, congestion collapse, uh, there is no way out. So when mobile networks are designed, uh, they basically said, look, we need to be able to control how the network behaves, right? If there is a stadium of people and they all want to talk, perhaps we'll drop everybody's throughput and latency goes really high. But nonetheless, I want to be able to service that important phone call or that important message or something else, right? So that's one, uh, control over the network. And uh, the second one, of course, is just a much larger network. A Wi-Fi wi access point is designed to operate on a range of tens of meters, maybe hundreds. Uh, this, this is, of course, much, much larger. And the second one is battery. So uh, today, nearly every wireless device has a Wi-Fi wi built in. But let's uh, recall that Wi-Fi was not designed for mobile devices specifically. 
Uh, wi the first Wi-Fi standards came out in the late 90s. Think back to the kind of phone that you had in the late 90s. Right? Uh, Wi-Fi was not designed for mem or for battery constrained devices. So uh, the second uh, constraint uh, for mobile networks is we need to optimize for uh, battery life because your radio is the second most expensive component uh, in your phone in terms of battery consumption. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is, for example, you go to 4G and we say, great, with 4G you can achieve uh, one gigabit data rates, right? It's like, well, wow, how do you do that? Well, we just have eight radios transmitting all at once at full power, right? So your phone literally has eight radios transmitting in parallel, right? Just draining your battery uh, like there's no tomorrow. You can get one gigabit and you have to be about a meter away from the station, but you can get one gigabit, at which point you could just run the cable, I guess. So all of that to say, uh, mobile networks have this concept or, or this, this uh, controller called the radio resource controller. And the, the, the basic way to think about it is uh, the radio resource controller controls when and who uh, is able to talk, right? So it, it's a moderator, effectively, right? I say, hey, I would like to ask a question or like to send some data. The moderator gets my message. It says, okay, I have the schedule. All of these people want to talk. I'm going to give you this slot. You're going to transmit it with this amount of power. And uh, that's the resource assignment that you have, right? He sends me back that assignment. I wait for my turn, and then I speak, right? So that's how mobile networks work. And by the way, the uh, radio res resource controller will also tell you when to go to sleep, right? So you'll be listening for incoming packets, and it'll, it'll just send a message to you and say, hey, there's like no traffic here. Uh, you're occupying uh, airspace. Uh, just go to sleep. I'll notify you when there is uh, new messages for you. So why is this important? Well, because it creates extra latency, right? Like there's all this overhead now. Compared to Wi-Fi, you just woke up and you start, started transmitting data. With the radio controller, you, you basically need to talk to him first, uh, get this assignment, and all the rest. So when you dig in into the standards, you'll uh, often find mentions of, the, of these concepts called the control and user plane latency. So the control latency is effectively what we just described, which is us talking to the moderator and asking for permission for when we can, uh, when we can talk. So what happens is the phone wakes up, right? So we, want, we, want to, we type in google.com, uh, we hit enter, or the go key, and the, the phone sends a message to the radio controller saying, hey, I would like to start transmitting data. Uh, the RAC, which in the 4G networks actually li lives at the actual radio tower, does the assignment and sends you back basically your, uh, your information. <coughs> On 3G networks, the radio resource controller actually leaves uh, deep in the core of the network, which is part of the reason why there is so much more latency uh, involved in 3G. <coughs> Jeez, sorry. Um, so if you look at the actual timing uh, for the 3G spec and 4G spec, this uh, first step, this control plane latency here, can take up to two and a half seconds. I mean, that is written in the spec, and in fact, it can often take uh, just as long. So this is before your phone can even send a single packet of user data or application data, right? Two and a half seconds passes, and then we can start talking, which, of course, is... Uh, terrible, has terrible implications for performance, right? We want to deliver pages in 200 milliseconds. Uh, well, we've got a problem here, right? So that's step one. Uh, this, is, this, of course, only happens once when you wake up your phone, right? So every time we need to transmit data. Uh, but nonetheless, this is very, very important. A lot of people think of uh, wireless networks or mobile networks specifically as highly unpredictable, the latency is so variable. Actually, once you factor this in, uh, you'll discover that uh, a lot of this variability can be modeled uh, fairly well, right? The first time you send the packet, there's going to be this long pause. After that, uh, it's pretty good. And once you have this assignment, you basically just start sending data directly to the tower. And, you know, depending on the standard that you look at, for example, most of the 3G networks or 3.9G networks in the United States are HSPA plus at this point. Um, and what this tells you here is that... Uh, Transmitting data from your phone to the radio tower takes an average about 10 milliseconds, which is still a lot of time. Uh, for, uh, for sorry, yes, uh, and for uh, LTE or the the 4G networks, it takes five milliseconds. But nonetheless, right? These are high. Uh, there, there's high overhead here. Now. <laughs> This looks very complicated, but I just want to illustrate the point of this is how a 4G network works, and this is why it takes hundreds of milliseconds. So just stay with me here, right? What we're trying to do here is we want to send a packet uh, of data 
from, let's say, your service to the phone. So the phone is currently idle, right? You've been moving around. Um, I need to send you a notification saying that, hey, you've got a new message from your favorite social network. So here we go. We start with one, right? So we, we, our service sends a packet of data. Uh, the packet of data comes to the packet gateway, which is basically like a router, right? Just like a router at your house, it terminates the TCP connection. Uh, this router doesn't actually know where you are on the physical network, so it sends it to another component called the serving gateway. The serving gateway kind of knows where you are in the geographical sense of like you're somewhere in San Francisco, right? So it gets the, the packet of, uh, of data, but it does, doesn't actually know which tower you're associated with at this point. Great. And uh, we also don't know if we should be forwarding this packet to begin with. So there's another component called the uh, uh, multimedia management entity, I think. <laughs> and uh, what, it, it, what it does and what its role is, is basically a user database, right? It, it knows who you are, what's your billing status, should I be forwarding packets or are you overdue on your bill and should I just drop the packet on the floor, right? So we query the user database and say, hey, I've got a packet for this uh, ID user, blah, blah, blah. Where do I send it? Well, the user database doesn't actually know either. So it's like, you know what? I'll just send, uh, I'll just flood the network. I'll just tell all the radio towers to flood the network and uh, send a beacon saying, hey, user X, you have a message for you, right? Tell me where you are. So all the radio towers send this uh, beacon. Uh, your device periodically wakes up, listens to it, and says, hey, there's a message for me. Great. Um, I'll talk back to the tower and say, hey, I, I'm here. I'm, you know register me at this point. The tower then registers you, sends the information back to this entity here, which goes back to the serving gateway, and then the serving gateway can funnel the data back to your phone, right? It's like, oh my god, right? What happened here? This is just for one TCP packet, right? Like, this is, this is nuts. Uh, but if you go back, right, this, this explains why there's so much overhead, right? So on 4G, we can do this entire flow in 40 to 50 milliseconds. And what's interesting is that the uh, 3G and 4G specs actually specify hard limits on the latency, right? So these are upper bounds. These are not averages. We're basically saying for 4G network, uh, the worst case scenario is 40 to 50 milliseconds, right? Um, well, in this case, this is AT&T, but for, uh, there's an actual hard limit on LTE that says 50 mils, and we have to meet this goal. And uh, the, basically, we're looking at the worst case scenario here. So it doesn't mean that every single packet will incur this cost. And of course, once we know where you are, you know, we can cache that data, and we don't have to kind of flood the network every single time. That'd be silly. Uh, but nonetheless, if you ever wonder, like, why does it take 300 milliseconds for a mobile network to route my packet? Uh, this is why, right? It's complicated. Uh, the problem here is that with Wi-Fi, you're associated with one access point, but with mobile networks, you know, you're mobile. You jump into a car and you start moving, and, and everything uh, goes out the door. But let's come back uh, a few steps. Uh, we've actually skipped. We said that latency matters for uh, web performance, but why, right? Why is so? There's this relation between bandwidth and latency. Uh, what's the problem to begin with? And that's where we need to go kind of one level deeper and look at TCP and how TCP works. So in a nutshell, when you start a new connection to a server, let's say you have a 5 megabit connection, right? Because, uh, or a 10 megabit connection on, even on your mobile phone. At the beginning of the connection, we can't actually use the full bandwidth of that connection. And the reason this works, uh, this is known as TCP slow start. Be, uh, the reason we have this behavior, this is built in into TCP, uh, is because we don't want to flood the network, right? Maybe the network is congested. So what we're going to do is we're literally going to start slow. You know, with this, we're going to start by sending a little bit of data, see if you receive it. Once you acknowledge it, I'm going to start continuing sending you more and more data, right? So what this graph is showing you here, this is known as the, this is the TCP slow start. Uh, phase here. So we start by sending you just a couple of packets. You acknowledge those packets. I double the number of packets I send you. You acknowledge those packets. I double the number of packets again. Right? So what this immediately tells, tells you is that it takes a certain amount of time for the bandwidth to ramp up to full, uh, full capacity of the link. So we can't even saturate the link immediately. And then after a certain point, you know, a packet loss event occurs. So maybe we've sent too much data. We've saturated the network. The packet is dropped and we back off and we restart the process with a slightly different algorithm, right? And this is how TCP works under the hood. So despite its name, uh, it's a feature, not a bug. Uh, and this is how TCP works. Uh, we, we don't, you know, this is inherent uh, in the protocol itself. So 
let's now look at the actual HTTP request. Like, what does it actually take to deliver a page, right? So we want to serve uh, the Google homepage really, really fast. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, first, we need to do a DNS lookup, right? So you type in a domain name. We need to figure out what is the IP address associated with that. On a mobile network, that can take a couple hundred milliseconds, as you saw, right? Plus the control plane uh, latency on top. After that, we need to do the TCP handshake, and we'll see an example in a second. The TCP handshake is just us opening the socket. That also takes a round trip of latency there and back, right? After that, we, ac we can actually finally send the HTTP request saying, hey, I would like to get the index page of your service. That'd be great, please. And uh, then the server, of course, generates the response. So that's the time on your, on your server, or your server response time. And after that, we also have the content download time. And the download time depends on how much bandwidth we have and how far along we are in the connection. Because you know, depending on if it's, a, if, if it's a new connection, then we are still subject to a slow start. And we can only uh, deliver data bit by bit. So here's an example, uh, kind of a very hands-on look. We skipped the DNS part, so this is just us trying to establish a TCP connection. So what I'm showing you here is let's fetch a 20 kilobyte file, right? a very small file, a 20 kilobyte file over a new TCP connection. And this is a, uh, I'm calling this a low latency link. So this is kind of like a typical desktop connection, right? 56 millisecond round trip uh, between, let's say, New York and London. It's kind of a, a good theoretical uh, number right now. So first, uh, we start with a syn packet. Uh, we get a synac, so this is our TCP handshake at the top right here. Then we send the actual get request uh, for the file. Uh, the server starts processing the request. You know, it generates the output of the HTML, etc. cetera. Uh, let's say that takes 40 milliseconds or so, and then it starts sending data. But because it's a new connection, it can only send you uh, about four kilobytes of data, right? So it sends you four kilobytes of data. You get this data. You're saying, great, I got it. You send an ACK back. You acknowledge all those packets. Now we double the window, and we send approximately 8 kilobytes of data. And then you ACK that, and then we send you the remainder. So just to transfer 20 kilobytes of data, we've had four round trips here. And if you add up the numbers here, right, this is 260 milliseconds. This is just for 20 kilobytes of data. Um, and of course, you know, we skipped DNS, so add a couple hundred, hundred milliseconds on top of that. And if we're talking over a secure connection with TLS, then there's another up to two round trips just to establish the secure connection. So you know, if, if this is a cold start, which is to say, I don't know what your IP address is associated with the host name, and I need to do a secure connection, uh, then we're looking at uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, it, just in this example, of over 500 milliseconds. Right? So that's... That's kind of the bottom layer of this. This is what's achievable with the current network uh, infrastructure. And by the way, uh, in this specific example, you know, why are we sending four kilobytes of data here? Uh, this is actually uh, part of the RFC, of the, or was part of the TCP RFC, which said you should start with a specific number of three or four network segments. Just recently, uh, this was actually updated to uh, start with 10 segments which if you do the math, if you follow the same workflow, will actually eliminate an extra round trip here. So uh, I'll talk about this later, but you probably want to update your Linux kernels to the latest version to get that, because that will immediately uh, improve the latency on all of your servers, or for all of your users, I should say. OK, so let's try the same example with, with a 3G or a 4G network. Right? So there's a couple of new things that we talked about. First, there is the control plane latency. This is, the, this is incurred if we have to wake up the radio. This is the first transmission that happens. So depending on which network type we're looking at, this could be 100 milliseconds or up to 2.5 seconds on uh, 3G. Then we do the DNS lookup, the TCP connection, uh, TLS, HTTP request, followed by a couple of round trips to fetch the same 20 kilobytes, and you add up the numbers, and you're looking at, you know, on a 3G network, somewhere in the neighborhood of between of one and four seconds, right? So now think back to that number that I was saying earlier last year when we said an average page load time for mobile was over five seconds. Well, this is in large part why, right? This is, it's not just a, a simple matter of like, oh, we build terrible mobile pages. It's like, well, that's how the network works. And uh, we're working, actively working on making it better. Uh, but these are the constraints that we have to work with when we design our pages. Like, we need to understand as web developers that it's going to take one to four seconds for the page to render, right? Because if I'm building, if I'm trying to build a responsive application, I can't, I can't design something where you click on a button and then we just kind of sit there for five seconds with the button stuck, right? You, I need to acknowledge the input immediately and then say, like, look, I'm, I'm working on it, right? This is a 3G network. I've got your data plan here. Uh, not my fault. 
uh, but you know, th there's certain things you can do in, in the UI design of your application to work around those. So some good news and some not so good news. <clears throat> First of all, you know, if you look around uh, or just turn on your TV, uh, you'll find a lot of 4G ads everywhere, right? Like 4G will save all things. The latest 4G network is here uh, faster than ever before, uh, which is cool. And I think a lot of us here are probably already uh, lucky enough to be in a 4G connection. But in reality, if you look at the industry projections, you'll find that the 3G networks will be the dominant network types of the next decade. Not just like this year or the next year, of this entire decade. Right? So what's happening is the current uh, carriers have invested a lot of time, money, and infrastructure into building out the existing network infrastructure, and they're just upgrading it. Um, the good news is, with the latest networks like H HSPA+, uh, they're actually backporting a lot of the great performance improvements from the latest 4G LTE networks into HSPA+. So performance-wise, they're actually getting better, much better. Um, and funny enough, you know, technically, the HSPA+, Plus networks shouldn't be called 4G, except they are, because they're almost quite like, you know, fast enough. So it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's 4G is a marketing term, uh, not really a technical term in that sense. So takeaways here, we can't count on users having 4G. In fact, even if you have a 4G data plan, your phone is switching between 4G and 3G uh, throughout the day, you know, based on congestion, based on where you are, based on the signal strength, etc. So uh, you can't just count on this you know, great 50 millisecond latency of 4G connection. The good news is, uh, is that the LTE adoption or the 4G adoption is actually way ahead of the curve across North America. So if you're specifically targeting you know, nor North America with your applications, uh, that's good news, right? So you can actually count on faster connections uh, f from your users, uh, which is good. But really, uh, if you look at the longer term projections, 4G networks, all the LTE networks will start to surpass existing infrastructure only after 2012. Sorry, 2020, not 12. I wish it was 12. So, you know, the, all of this is a very long way of saying latency is a bottleneck for web performance today. Uh, and it is a bottleneck because we download a lot of very small files and we require a lot of connections. And as you saw, there's TCP slow start. Uh, there is latency problems like our last mile latency even on, you know, within RSPs is very high, but it's much, much higher in, in a mobile context. And uh, the network won't really save us. We can't just sit back and say, like, great, you know, we're going to get a 30% improvement every year in latency. That is just simply not the case. Even in our wired networks, we're actually within a very small uh, constant factor of the maximum theoretical speed. Right? Like maybe we can squeeze out another 20% improvement and get a little bit closer to the speed of light, but we're already within like 1.3 uh, of the actual maximum. So uh, you know, if they discover how to make packets travel faster than the speed of light, then none of this is a problem and everything's great. Uh, but until then, uh, we've got a problem. 